Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to the uh, sponsors and organizers of ORS for uh, having me out. Uh, just love uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin in the middle of February. Um, I, I kid you not, I was uh, doing my email this morning and I got a, a, a plug uh, from um, this, this story appeared in today's National Journal written by Jerry Hagstrom. Sci agriculture has a science problem. Everyone in agriculture from farmers to agribusiness executives to the professors who conduct agriculture research say that decisions ranging from what to eat to settling international trade conflicts should be based on science. But developments in the past few weeks have raised questions about how much people should trust agricultural science and scientists. Amen. I'm going to cover a lot of ground today, and I'm going to try to go through the earlier part pretty quick. So strap on your, uh, your saddle tight. I'm going to cover all these areas um, and, and try to drive home the point that there are some fundamental inconsistencies and, and I would argue, unfairness in the way that government currently uh, deals with and addresses the uh, benefits of organic food and farming. We all know the, the basic policy framework and the way that we deal with organic. We had the 1990 Organic Food Production Act. We've got a massive 1,200-page organic rule. Uh, we have all the organic certifiers and uh, uh, th all of this uh, infrastructure, policy infrastructure for organic is familiar to all of you. There's two defining characteristics, often repeated statements, that always go hand in hand from official Washington, whether it's the Secretary of Agriculture testifying on the Hill or a department representative uh, responding to media. But the two things that the government is, is consistently saying about organic food and farming is that there is a suite of environmental benefits associated with organic farming that are really grounded in um, better treatment of the soil and the diversification of agricultural systems. But on the other hand, uh, there are no consistent or meaningful uh, food safety or nutritional benefits associated with organic farming. And we'll come back to these points repeatedly. So at the core of this talk is, are those statements and USDA policy positions, are they still consistent with modern science? And furthermore, are they consistent with the way federal agencies uh, craft, deal with, and implement other value-added seals and claims on food products. Let's just start really quickly with the USDA's commitment to quote-unquote sound science. Uh, this is a couple of quotes from the important uh, organic uh, food and agriculture policy declaration, whatever you call it, from Secretary of Ag Tom Vilsack. Uh, from May of 2013, uh, where he points out that if you put all of organic agriculture together as a sector, it would be the fourth largest in U.S. agriculture behind only corn, soybeans, and wheat, ahead of beef. Think of that. Um, and also, the one new piece of sort of policy infrastructure in this statement is that the USDA is now on record that organic agriculture contributes to rural economic development. There's also any number of documents, uh, executive branch documents, committing the department to the pursuit of sound science and the application of science uh, in carrying out both the policy formation process and all aspects of decision making. This is a, a memo from the Office of the Chief Scientist. Well, as we all know, all of us that have participated in this tango between science and policy in, in, in Washington, it's, a, you know, it's hard to say how the dance is going to go. Sometimes people are not very happy. I, I just couldn't resist sharing one episode of this that uh, happened you know, a, a number of years ago. Some of you in the room uh, were on the front lines with me when this was happening. Uh, July 1996, the Food Quality Protection Act passes, probably the most important piece of public health protection legislation passed in 50 years anyway fundamental change of the, the way that pesticides are regulated. The agricultural industry freaked out about it uh, and through uh, you know, their typical well-organized PR and political campaign, they stirred up all this concern that the, the EPA was about to ban all organophosphates for all uses. And this, this ad here, the World Without Lores ban, it's, it's just a classic. You know, 
here's the, you know, the folks, the old farmer with his truck with no vegetables to sell because he couldn't have his lures banned to spray on his tomatoes. Well, farmers weren't happy, so what happened? The Vice President of the United States, Al Gore, uh, barely a year and a half after President Clinton signed it, and I was at the signing, I was in the room watching President Clinton sign this bill. Al Gore sends a memo to the Secretary of Agriculture and the Administrator of EPA and basically says, okay, you know, we've got to base all these regulations on sound science and, you know, the farmers are upset and USDA is worried, so you've got to build them into the process. So basically, it was a memo from the Vice President telling these agencies to do all this stuff and hurry up the implementation of the EPA, of the FQPA, so that it wouldn't go forward very fast. And that's exactly what happened. The, this memo from Gore to Browner and Glickman gave the agency heads 14 days to develop uh, and come and report to him a plan for dealing with all of these complex issues. And of course, this, is, this was the beginning of the TRAC process, T-R-A-C, I think, T-R-A-C, I think maybe a couple people in the room might have even served on it. Well, TRAC was a huge mistake. It just provided a new forum to refight all the fights that had gone on for 15 years prior to the passage of the FQPA. Occasionally things go well in the policy process, the, the dance is uh, harmonious and everybody's happy, but it, you know, it takes, uh, often takes a lot of uh, data, but one of the problems with the, this dance is that the underlying issues are often very complex, they deal with complex biological systems and ecological interactions, and often we don't really know as much as we'd like. You know, we can gather a lot of science and do a lot of research and risk assessments, but you know, often the, pro the problems sometimes change faster than our ability to understand what happened in the stage before. And if that isn't the story with today's genetically engineered crops, I don't know what is. And lots of times the, the answers are very messy. So let's, let's move on and, and talk a little bit about the future prospects for value-added claims on organic products. So in general, um, a, a, farmer, a farmer or a food manufacturer that's certified organic uh, you know, can obtain registration as organic, but might be producing a product that is no more healthier and no more safer than conventional products. That's entirely possible. And this reality is one of the reasons that the USDA has been able to uh, maintain this policy position that there's no benefits. What they really mean is there's no consistent universal benefits that apply to all products certified organic. They leave that part out though, of course. Uh, but just remember that essentially all label claims on food products, they're made on brands. They're not made on product lines or, or, uh, or across all the products in a given category. They're made on individual products. And in many cases, qualitative nutritional quality or food safety claims can be made on certain brands. And, and they certainly can't be made on, on others. And we could think of uh, innumerable examples. And in fact, one of the things that's coming is the need to accommodate more truthful evidence and science-based value-added claims within the organic category. Not all, not all organic food is created equal, just as not all conventional food is as safe or as nutritious as organic food. Differences exist. And one of the themes of my talk is that our agricultural system right now is really struggling with how to deal with this natural inclination to compete on the grounds of nutritional quality and safety uh, along the food chain between conventional and organic, organic and biotech, et cetera, et cetera. And what I'm going to suggest is that the food industry needs to adopt the model that the German auto industry very consciously developed and implemented in the post-war period. Because they realized how important the auto industry was going to be to the economic reconstruction of that country. And the model was all German cars are high quality. No German brand. Mercedes doesn't criticize Volkswagen. Volkswagen doesn't criticize Mercedes. They all found a way to build all of the brands at different price points. And the German auto industry has benefited greatly from that ability. And uh, it's an important lesson for us to take home. 
So what's the future of some of the value-added organic claims? Um, there's certainly a number that are generic and can be made consistently and universally across most organic uh, products. And these are well known to everyone. Uh, pesticide dietary risk, the organic rule prohibits the application of, of uh, toxic synthetic pesticides. You can't use antibiotics and animal hormones. Uh, fatty acids and milk we'll talk about. And whatever risks are involved with GE crops, uh, organic food and farming avoids them. So there can be claims about that. And these are not insignificant um, contributions to public health protection. You know, I've probably spent as much time as anybody in the country analyzing the relative data on pesticide residues and risk in organic food compared to conventional food. I don't care how you cut the numbers. Organic agriculture eliminates 95, 97, 92 percent of the risk that's in the food supply from the use of conventional pesticides. Most people would consider that a pretty significant achievement. And there's just, the data is, it's unmistakable and there's a mountain of it. I mean, Brian Baker and I published a paper this last year that had, you know, 30 tables in it with, you know, showing uh, in great depth the differences in residues. Obviously, if you don't use hormones and treating your animals or antibiotics, you're not going to have any of the problems that are associated with them, and you're not going to contribute to this pool of antibiotic-resistant bacteria that are out there. And on the GMO front, well, you know, I, I obviously no one knows for sure what the full risk profile is from uh, American agriculture's love affair with the current generation of GE crops, but I think we can all admit now that it, it's not an entirely happy story. I don't think anybody knows how bad it's going to get before uh, the system realizes that they need to change. But uh, I personally think it's much more serious than, than people realize. But all the while, the rest of agriculture, certainly corn, soybeans, cotton agriculture, has been going down the GE road. Well, organic farmers have been cruising, cruising along, and I wouldn't say thriving, but they've been improving their art and their science. And, and, and getting, getting better. But one thing they haven't done is they haven't contributed a damn lick to the problems associated with GE crops. So one of the huge questions, of course, is what are the government agencies going to do when the organic industry or a branded organic food company steps up and says, OK, we want to put something on our label. We've got the science to, to prove it. that." truthfully informs consumers about the benefits in the, in the food. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Will the USDA and the FDA block evidence-based nutritional and food safety claims brought forward by organic brands? And you know, what are the standards that are going to be applied if Organic Valley comes forward to get a health claim for its vastly improved fatty acids fatty acid uh, balance in, in its pasture-raised uh, milk and butter, is the FDA going to say, well, no, you can't do that because it's got too much saturated fat or whatever? How, how will the government respond and what, what, are, what will criteria will be applied in reaching those judgments? So if you think about that question, isn't a logical answer to look at the criteria and the decision rules that are in other government programs that entail? the uh, approval, the sanctioning of a value-added claim. So let's look at them. There's, there's obviously uh, a whole slew of different possible organic brands and claims that, that could come forth. We're going to talk about some that involve nutrient content, some that involve health, uh, and, and some that involve uh, other aspects of farm production. We'll talk about some FDA programs, some USDA programs, and the EPA reduce risk program. And again, return to this question. Um, what kind of uh, criteria and decision process might be applied in the future in responding to claims about nutritional quality benefits and food safety benefits embedded in the methods used to produce a particular organic brand? So all of the nutrient claims that are on tens of thousands of products in the typical supermarket um, have been sanctioned and structured and approved under the provisions in the 1990 
Nutrition Labeling and Enforcement Act, a very important piece of uh, federal legislation. I think it was the first substantive change in food labeling law for 40 years, and I guess we're getting ready to do another one. Uh, but it sets out uh, these four types of generic claims, claims about the nutrient content, fiber, cholesterol, saturated fat, omega fatty acids, vitamin C, antioxidants, low, high, good source of. Structure function claims. This product builds strong bones. This product will help you avoid the flu. Direct health claims. Uh, uh, this product will, will help prevent cardiovascular disease health or, or prevent cardiovascular disease or promote heart health. That's a typical formulation of it. And this last beast, not very many of them, but what's called a qualified health claim. A qualified health claim is a health claim with a caveat or two thrown in. So, it's like um, in some people, uh, uh, consumption of resveratrol will slow the uh, will slow the aging process. Or in in some populations, this product has reduced the the risk of cardiovascular disease. So there's there's a conditionality in there, and sometimes there's conditionality about the link between ingesting more or less of the target substance and some defined health outcome. Brian, how long am I into this? Okay. Um, so these are the these are the common terms for uh, the nutrient content claims: high, more, good source. And basically, we're talking about a 25 percent difference between generally the branded product and the rest of the products on the shelf. The number of these claims, it's just extraordinary. 43% uh, of the new products introduced in 2010 had one or more claims. The newly introduced products contain an average of 2.6 claims per product. Uh, the, 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 products the new products uh, that came in in 2009, $73 billion of sales uh, had the claims, of, you know, almost 8,100 of them on new products in 2010. This is all from the, that really great ERS report that came out on, on uh, health and nutrition related claims. These are the, the top new claims on products in 2010. Uh, again, no news to anyone that spends any time walking down the aisles of a supermarket. Sort of the hot new ones, gluten free, high in antioxidants, omega-3 fatty acids or uh, variations on that theme and, and the real big new player on the block the non-GMO claim. So what, what sort of benefits come with these nutrient claims that get the official sanction from the government to say that you're better than the other guy? Well, the health claims, it's, it's a 25%, it's a sometimes more, of a particular nutrient than, than other products. But for a lot of these nutrients, we're already getting plenty of it, and it's not going to make much of a difference in, in our health. So there's really there's, there's no compelling evidence or convincing evidence that there's a big public health bump from people picking um, products labeled with either high or low of these basic nutrients. Um, and lots of times the link between more or less of the nutrient and a particular health outcome is, uh, is, is weak or uh, subject to a, a high level of scientific uncertainty. So USDA also very verifies through its process verified program um, a, a number of claims. I got the printout of the current ones. There's about 70 of them. And so this is an example of the, the Harvest Land Chicken Purdue claim. What Purdue did is they went, went to the National Chicken Council and got their sort of recommended good agricultural practices for people raising chickens, uh, wrapped, wrapped a bow around it. Uh, it, it codifies and allows subtherapeutic use of antibiotics, uh, use of hormones. It basically codifies what chicken farmers are doing now. Rated uh, no huge surprise is not meaningful by consumer union. Uh, the grass-fed meat and dairy claim. Kind of sounds good on paper, 100% grass-fed beef, uh, grass-fed feed for, for ruminant animals, but there's some uh, enforcement flexibility in there. Uh, much more than many people would like to see. There's also an animal doesn't have to be on this program throughout its whole life. Uh, there's some wiggle room in terms of the use of grain silage. 
and again, for a host of reasons, the uh, Consumers Union has rated this label as not meaningful. Uh, the one that CU does feel is meaningful is this thing called Never Ever 3. How, how many people had heard of this before this talk? Anybody out there? So see, it's not, it's not very well known. I had never heard of it. Uh, well, it's one that several of the meat companies have picked up, and it's basically no antibiotics, no hormones, and no feeding um, recycled animal protein, i.e., what you get from the renderer uh, to help prevent, among other things, mad cow disease. CU does rate this as, as meaningful. So in terms of these programs, again, with the exception of Never Ever 3, they don't have a huge impact. I suppose they prevent some of the most egregious uh, and, and inhumane practices uh, in livestock agriculture. So turning just for a second to the pesticide program, this is one I was quite involved in in the day. I bet Tom Green remembers it well. It came out in 1997. It was the Reduce Risk Program. And the basic idea is EPA is going to drive off the market or was hoping, hopefully we were hoping they would drive off the market a lot of high-risk pesticides following the passage of the FQPA in 1996. So farmers were saying, well, golly gee, can't EPA then speed up the registration of lower-risk, safer alternatives? So a policy was structured to do that. I commented on it among many other people. And it basically offered the benefit of expedited registration for pesticides that could meet the criteria. There's a big benefit dropping the average time in registration from 38 months to 14 months, so two years. That's worth a lot of money to a chemical company if they can get on the market two years quicker. Uh, any of a multiple risk could qualify a pesticide application as reduced risk. And generally, in at least one of the recognized risk areas, risk had to go down 35%. There was a set of specific criteria if you just were putting in an improved formulation of an existing chemical. 35% uh, reduction in the rate, 10x uh, improvement in applicator risk, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this was a wildly popular program. Uh, uh, I would say about two-thirds of the registrations in the active period went through this window. Mo most of the new registrations for glyphosate, all the IGRs went through this window. Uh, that's insect growth regulators. That's spinosad, all the strobulin fungicides, and all the nicotinals. Nic you know, back in the day when the nicotinals were coming through the registration program, they looked a, a lot better than chlorpyrifos and methamidifos and oxidimeton methyl and, and aldicarb. Uh, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, as we've learned since, it, it's a, always a bit more complicated than it seems. In the case of glyphosate, sure, glyphosate was less risky than some of the herbicides that, that it replaced, but getting it on the market earlier just speeded up the emergence and spread of resistant weeds and, and increased this excessive reliance on herbicides. And now we've got a, a full-scale train wreck unfolding in corn, soybean, and cotton country. Nicotinals, you know, the, the jury is just out, although I hear the department is now uh, sort of upping the pressure on and the recognition that nicotinal insecticides are a big part of the cause of the collapse in pollinator health. Glad to see that. Uh, pollinator risks weren't even on the table when EPA accelerated the registration to these materials. So, so just stepping back for a moment, so what did these officially government sanctioned, implemented, advertised uh, programs that gave companies bragging rights for their products, whether it's a pesticide or a high fiber cereal, what did they really bring about in terms of improved public health or environmental quality? Well, the nutrient content claims not much, maybe a little bit, bit of improvement in health. Uh, some studies show that people felt, well, heck, I can eat more. I can eat more of this because it's got less uh, saturated fat in it. So some people say that the claims actually haven't contributed to any meaningful public health gain. So it's a, and the health claims, there's really not enough of them out there. I mean, they, they certainly have a marginal increase in, in a positive effect because there has to be 25% more omega-3 fatty acid or uh, lycopene or, or other beneficial substance to qualify for it. The USDA process verified, you know, really not much there. It's really hard to make a case that they're contributing in any significant way. And EPA's reduced risk program, it, it brought some safer chemistry on the market quicker, but it also let 
some chemicals on the market quicker before EPA really looked at them in depth. There might have been time to recognize the, the fact that the nicotinols from the get-go were the most toxic pesticide. The imidacloprid, the first one, was the most toxic pesticide ever discovered to bees. And if they'd taken a little bit more time looking at it, maybe they would have thought through some ways to try to protect pollinators when that material came on the market in 1994. But they didn't. So compare that record of performance to what the unequivocal proven benefits of organic. Pesticide risk down at least 95%. Pesticide risk is a pretty big category. There's a lot of risks in the diet. And what, whatever they are, they're not happening on organic farms. Antibiotics and, and growth hormones and, and risk related to that. Again, a lot of debate about how big those risks are, but 100% reduction isn't bad. GE crop risks, agronomic and otherwise, risk to the seed supply. Again, 100% avoidance. But still, the USDA contends there are no consistent or meaningful differences in the nutritional quality or safety of organic versus conventionally raised food. Is there something, something I'm missing here that we're all missing? Let's, let's cruise really quickly through some of the uh, private sector programs. I think you know where this is headed. So um, in 1986, following the publication of the Delaney Paradox Report, a few of you will remember this history, a new startup company in Oakland, California, Scientific Certification Systems, decided to start a pesticide residue testing program hoping that they'd pick up some clients from the national coverage that that Delaney Paradox Report got. And they did, and they started the NutriClean program. Back then, the standard was 0.05. Uh, progressive grocers, mostly in the West, have spent millions of dollars testing produce through the NutriClean program. Uh, it used, the standard used to be 0.05. They've got it down to 0.01 now. And any produce that has a pesticide residue below 0.01 can be labeled under the scientific certification program as pesticide free. Well, you know, the problem with this is a number of studies and databases show that NutriClean tested produce has about as many pesticide residues as conventional produce. The residue levels are maybe a little lower, not that much difference. And of course, it's not at all surprising because NutriClean certifies conventional, uh, conventional produce for the most part. No big differences. Pesticide free only means free of residues that they test for above 0.01 parts per million. There are several pesticides that they don't test for where the residues are almost surely above 0.01. You know, details, details. And it, we have to remind people that for high risk pesticides, a residue level of 0.01, it, you know, there's probably some people, Carl Winters and other people in the chemical industry that will argue that there's no pesticide on the market today that isn't safe at 0.01. But I, I guarantee you there's some toxicologists and epigenetic experts that will take them on. So another pesticide risk reduction program, a new one, is Whole Foods. It's embedded in this produce and floral rating system that Tom Green and I have had the, the, the distinct pleasure and honor of contributing to over the last few years. Uh, their program is going to work because it's data-driven. It uh, takes advantage of the... The, the latest science from, from EPA, to the extent that we could measure pesticide risks in the diet, that program's gonna reduce them because they're just gonna keep picking off the top ones and getting rid of them. It's, you know, it's kind of a mechanistic approach to it, but if you, you, know, if you believe in science and risk assessment, it's the way to go about it. So this, this Whole Foods program, I think many of you are roughly familiar with it. It rates, it provides a basis for rating all the produce and floral SKUs is good, better, or best. Obviously, the standards go up the, and, and are stricter. Um, but um, it, you know, in short, we've at Whole Foods' direction in structuring the program and developing the do not use list, we focused on pesticides known to trigger neurological development problems. And uh, there, there are not going to be there are not going to be very many residues of those pesticides in Whole Foods stores, and there'll of course be none in all the organic produce that's sold in Whole Foods. Uh, the 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 thing about the Whole Foods program, I'm so proud of I'm I'm proud of what Tom and I did to help build, and I'm proud of them to have for having the guts to do it as they apply the exact same program to all their imports. 
So they avoid this problem in the way that the EPA has implemented the FQPA. Probably the, the biggest and most important benefits of the Whole Foods program are going to be received by farm workers outside the United States and the environment. And, you know, that's not a bad thing. Now, on the non-GMO front, I, I don't know if you, how many of you are aware of this incredible growth in the non-GMO uh, product uh, claim. 8.5 billion of products in 2004 have the claim, up 31 times in, what, six years. Remember that earlier slide in 2009, the total value of all health claims was 73 billion. And now just the non-GMO claim in 2014 is up to 8.5 billion. I don't know if it's the leading claim, but I'll bet you it's in the top three. And that's really amazing when you think about it. It didn't even exist a few years ago. So for something to catch on this fast is it's really astounding. And you know, we all have to kind of step back and think. Many of us were involved in the early days of was it a good thing to, to label GMO food? Should it be the private sector? Should the NOP do it? And I, I think many of us feel we've kind of created a monster and can't control it anymore. So let's talk a little bit about the benefits of, of labeling non-GMO foods. You know, on multi-ingredient processed foods that don't have corn, soybeans, or canola as a major ingredient, for consumers it's very little unless unless the hope is the non-GMO project is going to put an end to agricultural biotechnology as we know it. If that's, if that's your goal, you know, maybe there's some benefit, but it, it's, uh, it's a bit of a stretch. For processed foods that have corn, soybeans, or canola as one of the top four or five ingredients, you know, there could be some significant GE content in that product, maybe 5%, maybe 20%, who knows. Um, now, for the, the, the new fresh fruits and vegetables coming on the market, that's a very different story. There's this new BT sweet corn. It's got two BT genes, and it's Roundup Ready. It's been on the market for two years. I've calculated the amount of BT proteins you get from two years of that corn. It's a significant dose. A lot of us take pills with less than what's in that. And so, obviously, uh, if sweet corn producers sought non-GMO project verification, that would be really meaningful. Now, you know, if the apple industry, if David Granistein's got to talk all of his apple buddies in Washington into going non-GMO because of Arctic apples, what a waste. Arctic apples aren't going to create any GE proteins in the apple. You know, it's just a, it, it would be really a shame if the apple industry has to spend a lot of money testing for GM content in apples because of Arctic apples. There's no foreign DNA put into those apples. But I can, you know, I can see some people will probably do it. So um, future prospects. Okay, so we, we've acknowledged, we've acknowledged that there's variability across organic brands, uh, uh, and and that's a reality that has to be dealt with. Um, and we also acknowledge that the Organic Food Production Act and the NOP rule, it it its goal was not to create nutrient dense food. And it doesn't do it. And, and there was a number of reasons why that attempt was not made. But I would argue that the, the time has come for us to revisit this decision and um, move ahead with a, at least a small corner within the NOP rule for value-added claims. And I'll give you some examples. It is premature to make any nutrient-based claims generically across all organic tomatoes, all strawberries, all wheat. I can't think of a single crop where generically we could do it now. There's a few that are close, and I'll show you the data on a couple. But we have to admit this, this is the case. Um, but there's certainly a number of brands of plant-based foods that could do it uh, uh, very handily. This was the meta-analysis that I had the privilege to participate in with this big team of Europeans that came out in the British Journal of Nutrition in July. You know, this is a very technical paper. Uh, and by the way, we, we had a lot of talk about budgets for organic in the EU versus here. Carlo Leffer raised $476,000 from the EU to pay for this meta-analysis. 
there probably has barely been a single organic field research project with that much money invested in. I mean, this kind of a study would, it's, it's 10 or 20 years uh, away before the U.S. will put that kind of money. This was a very, very extensive, detailed, difficult project. Um, and it's the state-of-the-art study. It's, you know, it really, I think, will finally uh, bury the sad memories of the Dangor et al. 2009 study and the Smith-Spangler 2012 Stanford study, which both of which were just so flawed. The reaction to this thing, this uh, British Journal of Nutrition, it was just, it's just off the charts. I mean, other than the alternative ag report that Brian mentioned, this thing got more press than anything I've done in my career. 615 million impressions. It's just a mind-boggling number. It had a whole page of coverage in the London Guardian, a whole page of stories about this study in the number two paper in London. The, it, it was just a, it was phenomenal. I mean, we, we did a lot of things right and we got very lucky. We were between the crash of one of the Malaysian planes and invading Israel. It was that two-week period. We kind of got right in the middle. And so if we'd gone earlier or later, might have been 215 million. So the, this, the antioxidant claim for plant-based foods is one that's really close. Now this is the average. This is the average mean difference for antioxidants in plant-based foods. So if that's the average, you know damn well there's going to be some well above that average and some well below it. So, you know, there probably are a, a few plant-based foods and for a few nutrients where it's pretty close. But still, to get one of those claims, you have to show consistency across all the, all the product in the marketplace if you're going to do it across brands. The cadmium finding, particularly for vegetables, it's an interesting finding. I'm not sure it would fly as well in the U.S. as it does in Europe. There seems to be a bit more of a problem with cadmium in European food, both conventional and organic than here, but it's a possibility. So how to, how to start to set the stage for generic organic nutrient content claims? And, you know, this is, uh, uh, this is something that's going to take some time, but uh, if we don't start working on it, it probably will never happen. I think it is possible and, and it will be necessary to modify OFPA and, and probably the rule to provide for certifications of kind of special systems that are designed and science proven to deliver some specific benefit. A tomato system that produces high lycopene content. Grape systems with elevated resveratrol. Uh, on, and you can go down the list. Uh, you know, some of these new wheats that Steve Jones is breeding, they have some really elevated and highly beneficial uh, mineral content levels. Uh, so where I think the sweet spot is, there are a number of human populations out there that have unique nutritional needs because they have health problems. And the, the food industry is trying in every way they can to develop functional foods. You've all heard that term. There's absolutely no reason why the organic industry can't develop and, and market and get approval of a functional food addressing a specific health problem. Uh, and uh, it can, it, the process can be patterned after the FDA health claim. Now, maybe we should encourage the formation of some industry consortia to work together uh, where three or four of the leading companies uh, you know, imagine if Cascadian and Driscoll's uh, got together to work on berries in the Pacific Northwest or Stemolt and Zirkel on tree fruits, uh, Nature's Path, Annie's and Cliff Bar. All of them use a lot of oats, a lot of wheat, a lot of spelt in their products. Do a, a little food value chain consortium with breeders and millers to develop some flavor and, and vitamin and, and mineral enhanced uh, wheats and, and grain products. So, how, how, could we, how could this sort of happen? Well, we have a thing called the Organic Center. I had the, the privilege and pleasure of working there for a number of years. Uh, the, the, the TOC could work with the industry, could go to NIFA, can apply for USDA grants or foundation grants to develop uh, a research program with uh, uh, scientists in different parts of the country where a particular crop is grown to develop standard operating procedures to produce elevated nutrient content food. What does it take to consistently hit that 25% higher level of nutrient X, Y, or Z? 
uh, it can be done. It, it will be done. Now, imagine if the, the controversial uh, checkoff program, the organic checkoff program, if it is funded, this is exactly the way the research portion of the dollars ought to be spent, at least some of them. Uh, doing this kind of work to get a strong science base behind the nutritional benefits of organic food is, that is the best way to promote, promote sales of organic food, and, and one of the best ways in my opinion. Another option would be to, uh, there's this new thing called FFAR, it was passed in the last Farm Bill, it's the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research. Congress appropriated 250 million bucks, it's sitting in the bank. FR is going to spend it soon. They're going to raise a matching $250 million from ADM and Cargill and Monsanto and John Deere and all the other big agribusiness players. That's going to create a pot of money, $500 million. That's half of, almost half the ARS budget. So FR is going to spend it. And they're going to, their mission in life is to fund research that's not being funded by the traditional NEFA AFI programs, like the benefits of organic food and farming, for example. So somebody needs to push FR to do this. They need to be petitioned. Somebody's got to put together the case. I think this is, a, again, the kind of thing that TOC and OTA ought to work on. Uh, and, and it's the kind of thing that, I mean, I've talked to Dan Glickman about this. He's the, the chair of the board of FR. He's interested in doing this. The man has a soft spot in his heart for organic. He really does. And again, you know, hook, let's hook our... Let's hook our wagon to a strong horse. There's a lot of pregnant women out there that like their babies not to have birth defects, not to lose 5 or 7% of IQ to OP insecticides in their food. You know, there's people that they want this. They want government to help them have safe food so their babies are born healthy and grow up healthy. So let's, let's try to meet that need. So, um, I'm also, you know, I, I still think, despite the fact it's a harder road to hoe on the plant-based side, uh, Mirglen, Lycopene, they've got data. They had data I saw three or four years ago that I think would have been enough. There's a couple of claims around berries that I think are ready to go. Uh, and I, I couldn't resist putting organic valley milk because now we're going to switch to uh, um, an area of the organic food supply where there are some really strong and important health claims that are ready to go. We don't have to wait for a lot of new science. So to me, you know, having, I, I'm probably, I, I'd be surprised if there's anybody in the country that's read a higher percent of all the original research in plant-based foods and animal foods comparing organic and conventional than I have, because I've worked on all these projects. I've been, it's been my job. I've been paid to do it. And trust me, you wouldn't want to try to do all that in your free time. Um, and I think the single most ready, big, important health claim is the improved fatty acid profile in organic milk. And I think that is big enough that it probably could be applied to all organic milk. And maybe with a little tweaking of the rule, you know, that you can't feed more than 50 pounds of organic corn silage to organic cows per day or something like that might actually do it. And again, the smart way to start going down this path is to pick uh, a claim and a product where the evidence is overwhelming. And boy, if you look at the fatty acid profile in organic valleys, grass-fed milk or butter or cheese, it's one-to-one, -one, omega-6 to omega-3. It's, it's crazy, it's crazy good, and, and it's consistent as the day is long. And we know why, and we can prove why, and because of that, we can convince the government of it. And I think, uh, you know, I, I'd say in five years, I'll be disappointed if there isn't an, or, an organic valley product on the market with a health claim. I'm going to push to try to make that happen. This is, of course, this is the, the paper that we got in PLOS One in December of 2013, where we took the organic valley data uh, over the, the, all the processing plants and compared the fatty acid profile in organic milk to conventional milk, largest study of its kind ever done in the world. And again, we, we didn't get, I was shocked that we actually got more media on the plant-based one, but this was pretty spectacular. Two great stories in NPR um, made a big, big, uh, big impression on a lot of people. And so the basic finding is that, you know, if you feed Organic cows get a lot more forage-based feed. They have to because of the rule. 
you've got a drop in the omega-6 fatty acids, which are the bad ones. They promote inflammation and cardiovascular disease, and a boost in the good ones, the omega-3s. Corn is the building block of omega-6 fatty acids. Just a good chemist could go through the charts to convince you of that. I'm not a good chemist. But these, well, you know, these are 20, 15, 20 percent differences, but when you put them together, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio drops from 5.8 in conventional milk, which is better than most sources of food in the food supply, by the way, all the way down to 2.3, which is some people would regard that as a perfect ratio. Some people would like to see it go down a little bit more. Uh, and others endorse up to about a 4 to 1 ratio. But it, any way you cut it, this is a huge, this isn't a 20 percent difference. This is a huge difference. And the thing that we did in that paper that was so important is a lot of people have said in response to the previous studies showing that organic milk had a better profile of fatty acids, said, well, who cares? Well, milk doesn't have very many omega-6s. It's not a good source of it. So even if it's a lot better, it doesn't matter. Well, we modeled it, and we showed that it does matter, and it matters way more than people thought. I'm out of time. I this, is, this is the nutrition modeling we did. But basically, this triple intervention, real simple. You switch from conventional dairy products to organic dairy products, add one serving a day, so you're about uh, you're about at, uh, I think it was three and a half servings of dairy products a day, which is just a little higher than the average in America, and avoid one food a day that's known to be very high in little lake acid, the bad omega-6. So, so that'd be potato chips, french fries, uh, chicken McNuggets, uh, any fried food. One serving of one fried food a day. And if you do that, you can lower your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in the baseline from 11.3, which is just about average for the U.S. population, all the way down to 4.1. Now, you know, what have you done? You're eating the same dairy products, you did switch to organic, and you're avoiding one bad food that you shouldn't be eating anyway. Now tell me, if people understood they could improve that much an uh, important driver of their health, that they wouldn't be more motivated to do it. So we've got more coming on the animal product front. This big team based in the University of Newcastle that I've, I've uh, uh, been working with, there's a meat organic meta-analysis coming out maybe in a couple months and a dairy one a couple months later. Very clear, strong findings, all uh, based on feeding forages and the omega fatty acid shift in both animal products and dairy. That's the, that's the big benefit of organic uh, in animal products, and it is a big benefit, and it is totally consistent. Um, just to show you how science marches on, when Danger did his study in 2009, there were only 11 uh, studies uh, on dairy in his meta-analysis. We had 172, um, and. You know, so as I said, you know, science marches on. There's a much bigger, better database now on all of these uh, to do this type of meta-analysis. And when you use state-of-the-art statistical tools, you know, nobody can. I mean, sure, there are, people are going to argue about it, but it's much more. It's just much more compelling information. So, dairy saturated fat down seven percent, not insignificant. Omegas up forty-six percent. Omega, this ratio down 79 percent. Remember our goal is 25 percent for an improvement? Conjugate analytic like acid, a very important saturated fatty acid, a polyunsaturated fatty acid, up 34 percent. And you know, higher levels of, uh, of uh, the precursor to, to vitamin A, but not hugely higher, but in, in important nonetheless. Similar kinds of findings in meat. Uh, total fat down, polyunsaturated fatty acids up, omega-3s up. Long chain PUFAs, the very important EPA, DHA, and EPA, up 24%. And we use in this paper as a metric of uh, the healthfulness of, of uh, meat products so, uh, something called the, th the thrombogenicity index. It's used in the biomedical literature. It's simply a ratio that has the saturated fatty acid content of a food in the numerator, which is sort of the bad stuff, and the good stuff in the denominator. So 
in foods with a lot of saturated fatty acids and not a, oh, not a lot of omega-3s, you have a high thrombogenicity index, which is correlated with cardiovascular disease risk. So here's the case for USDA reforming its policies. According to USDA, we've, you know, we agree that there are these environmental benefits and we need to do more work on them and we need to make them more robust, uh, but it's time to really challenge the, the uh, no uh, nutritional quality or food safety uh, benefits. So, you know, are these statements consistent with science? No, they're not. Are they consistent with the decision rules and criteria that the government has applied in similar programs that have sanctioned a value-added claim relative to nutrient content or food safety? No, it's not consistent. So policy changes, really, they have to be made or the USDA and the FDA are going to increase the chances that people are going to start not believing them, not placing trust and confidence in their judgments. You know, they say that everything they do is based on the most up-to-date and sound science, but then when it's not, people are going to ask questions. And the, the much tougher questions, as many of you in this room know, they're coming from Europe, they're coming from Japan, they're not coming from inside the United States. But, you know, the rest of the world isn't sitting on its hands in this area. If international markets lose confidence in the credibility and the integrity of the science behind U.S. regulatory agencies that are approving new GE crops, improving new pesticides, improving new animal drugs, improving new health claims, if they lose confidence in that, that's going to hurt U.S. Agriculture, Inc., uh, because we're going to have a more difficult time getting into health-conscious, safety-conscious, value-added markets. That's where the money is. So. You know, if you, you, you can almost see the U.S. sort of drifting to become the Walmart of the global food system. You know, it's, everything's this bulk commodity, everything's got lots of sugar, lots of, lots of saturated fat, lots of salt, kind of tasteless. Um, you know, not a, lot, not a lot of special stuff going on, where if you look at Europe, they're going in exactly the opposite direction. There's all this differentiation and diversity and value-added stuff going on. And I am firmly of the opinion that the mishandling of GE crop technology and this whole revolution in GE foods, it's really costing the U.S. around the world in terms of confidence and trust in, in, our, in our regulatory programs. And as people around the world learn what we actually have done and what we haven't done, it's going to get worse. So what can people do? What can companies do? Well, revisit, revisit your uh, standard operating procedures and, and look to see where you might be able to support some nutrient content claims. You've got to test. You've got to test your food. You have to test your competitor's food. See if you can start to identify some areas where there's a, a consistent 25% or more difference. Start to think about working with breeders and researchers and millers to develop these, these sort of nutrient-dense systems. You know, the nutrients are maximized the day that farmer takes the crop out of the field. Everything that happens to it from there on, nutrients go down. So lots of opportunities to try to hold those nutrients in the food. Um, and, you know, push the companies need to push the agencies a little bit. You know, don't necessarily take no for an answer. If you get no for an answer a couple times, sue them. It's what, it's, how do you think Monsanto has come to dominate and, and own half the seed industry. You think they've sat on their hands? No, they've been very aggressive and they're very good at it. And there are, there are other companies that, that are uh, emulating that example. And, you know, if we want to see this industry grow, we've got to get with, uh, get with the program, as, as distasteful as it may be to us. So growers, retailers, activists, you know, push for change, demand change, and at a minimum, demand fairness. You know. Americans may not be into getting into the middle of the fight between biotech advocates and organic advocates, but most Americans really care about fairness. And I think a strong case can be made that the organic food and agriculture sector is being discriminated against systematically, systemically. 
uh, I think to make that case and to change it, we've got to pay closer attention to the science. The activist community has got to get some discipline and stop going off on these crazy tangents and, you know, putting up a graph that, you know, that shows glyphosate going up and autism going up and say, see, that proves it. You know, we've got to get, we've got to up our game in how we talk about these problems and, and how we use science. We've got to come together as consortia of companies, of companies, research organizations, NGOs, consumer groups, to work on this value-added innovation. I mean, uh, Dag Flock of Nature's Path, they've got some really cool, interesting, hopeful new projects that are, you know, one or two years down the road, developing this kind of industry-based consortium. And, and he thinks they are going to have these nutrient-dense value-added supply chains ready to go in two or three years. I think it's terribly encouraging. Um, and, you know, I think this, this idea of hooking up with consumers that know they've got a problem that's in part rooted in food, the nutrient content in food, the safety of food, they want alternatives. And boy, you get some of them pushing for one of your value-added claims and the, the political dynamic changes. There's a vital role for uh, uh, leadership too if we're, if we're going to make any significant uh, headway. I, it just makes me sick to see some of the dysfunction within the broader organic community and it just seems to be getting worse. Uh, we've just got to find a way to, you know, de I call it demilitarizing the circular firing squad. You know, it's just some people think that, you know, th that the only way to save organic is to, is, is to, you know, raise all these spurious claims about how bad certain organic farms or certain organic food is. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's a terribly damaging uh, um, tactic uh, uh, when it, you know, when, when we're trying to convince the 90% of the public that really doesn't know much about organic and sometimes first impressions stick. So I, I think a constructive step would be to try to get some collaborative work going on these value-added claims that certain brands are going to pursue. And, you know, so instead of some of the you know, Cornucopia Institute and OCA doing boycotts against a company, they can actually be for something positive with, you know, Mothers Against Breast Cancer or other NGOs or, or consumer organizations that are really motivated to do something about a problem, working on something positive. I think that would be better than the path that we're on now. And let, I think we, we all have to remind ourselves there still is a substantial organic halo out there. The whole sector benefits from it and will continue to benefit from it, but we all have to up our game in protecting it. And that is a, I, I think we all have to agree, that's a mission critical task for everybody. And, and so those among, among us and organizations that feel that that is not important, you know, we have to have a dialogue with them and try to convince them otherwise. So this is it, last slide. You did it, folks. Uh, I don't see anybody asleep. Yeah, you should be impressed I did it. Um, Okay, three things. Um, I think science is actually going to get more important and not less, even though there's so much bad stuff going on in, in the area of science. Uh, I think there's a lot of companies that they've watched what's going on in the last 10 years and they say, oh, let's just use PR and our political cloud to hell with science. We'll be all right. You know, one study one study can bring an industry to its knees. And some of those studies are coming. I, I, I really, unfortunately, I feel that uh, that's true. And that's, it's important, you know, and the, even the scientific community has to be shook up uh, once in a while and in the United States quite a bit. I also am quite certain that in the next 20 years, we're going to see significant policy changes happen only under certain rare circumstances because our whole system has become so dysfunctional and, and, and the public is so divided and the companies are so powerful. There's a whole bunch of reasons why Congress and the executive branch have been gridlocked for a long time and I don't see any chance that that's going to get any better, at least not quickly. 
So other things are going to drive policy change. Do you think all those people in New England that went through this last winter, you don't think they're a little bit more attuned to what global warming can do than, than they were before? So I think, I think uh, dramatic events, uh, a major, you know, there's going to, there'll be another, regrettably, another major food safety outbreak where several people die. These sorts of things and, and, and litigation are going to drive policy change to agree that um, hasn't been true for a long time. I, I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. I'm just saying this is how, this is what I see and, and uh, I think it's, it's worthwhile thinking a little bit how to, um, how to perhaps engage that process to promote the public good. At last, uh, I, I think the sort of really undiscovered, well, it's, it's certainly not undiscovered by this group, but soil quality, soil health, I think there's a lot of interest and there's a real awakening about this. And, you know, if you want to if you want to see farms that, that have their act together in, in the soil health department, you go to a long-term financially stable organic farm. And every, every one of them has their act together on that. So we, you know, it's in, in this quest of how do we change contemporary farming systems to more effectively promote soil health and incrementally build soil quality, we don't have to go out and do the research or figure out how to do it. We know how to do it. There's a whole bunch of farmers that are doing it. And I think people are going to realize that, and I think they'll start to use the successful organic farmer as a model for um, guidance on how to get serious about um, promoting soil, soil health and soil quality, as complicated as that is. Hey folks, it's a, it's a bit, it was a long talk. I, I didn't know uh, if you could last through it, but uh, um, I, I hope you felt it was worth it. Thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be no questions. Thank, thank you, Chuck. Yes, there, you're, you're mistaken there. There, I see hands already, and I'll. Thanks, Chuck, for a great talk and all your great work. Um, I'm curious that you said you didn't think the pesticide-free label would go anywhere. I mean, it is such an important criteria for people why they buy organic. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The pesticide-free label. You, I thought you said that wouldn't go anywhere. Well, it's misleading. It's just too misleading. It's not honest. Uh, and it hasn't gone anywhere. I, I checked out the latest uh, list of uh, scientific certification systems, um, NutriClean certified products. It's it's pretty thin. Uh, I'd say that program is doing. Tom, do you have any idea? Maybe a tenth of the business it used to. No, but I mean for organic. For what? Could organic food rely on that label? Well, it's also not truthful. Organic food is not pesticide free. Uh, about 25% of organic samples have a residue of a prohibited synthetic substance. Uh, we live in a world that's, you know, where there's a lot of pesticides used. David uh, Granstein and I talk a lot about uh, there's two, and it's actually a little bit more than two, two post-harvest fungicides on average on each sample of organic apples tested in the last round of PDP testing. Now there's two and a half in conventional. Now, and the levels in the organic are between 20 and 154 lower. So it's clear that when they're running the organic fruit through the packing sheds, they're not, they're not spraying the post-harvest fungicides that they sprayed the day before when the conventional fruit went through. But it's also abundantly clear you cannot clean out a processing facility overnight and get rid of the residues. You can't do it. The most common residue in certified organic food now are post-harvest fungicides. Let's see, the um, uh, main one, the number one is ipridione, number two is fludioxanil, number three is another new one, and number four is imazil. And those four together account for almost half of the residues found in organic food. When you add in the residues of the banned OCs, that's about another 25%. Then the next big group is the, prohib is the allowed. Uh, pesticides, and in particular spinosad and neem. It's legal for organic farmers to use those products, and spinosad's a great big hairy stable molecule, so if somebody sprays spinosad on a fruit or vegetable crop, there's going to be residues, but those are legal. And it's just two or three percent of the residues that remain are kind of your, your synthetic chemical bad actors that, you know, 
shouldn't be there. You know, things like uh, chlorpyrifosin and sweet peppers from, from Mexico. So we, we know a lot about the residues in organic food. And one thing we know we can't say is it's not pesticide free, but let's talk about risk levels and reduction of risk. We, we, can, we can have that conversation. Yeah, Chuck, uh, very thoughtful and thought provoking, thanks. Uh, uh, but you didn't mention water. And water is the most essential nutrient there is. I mean, we can go days without food, but we can't go days without water. And there's limited research on the impacts of organic systems on protecting both ground and surface water quality. I think there needs to be more of it. To me, it's a low-hanging fruit. It's the science could easily be established to document the improvement, just like on soil health, um, and biodiversity, but also on protecting water quality. And I think over this next 20 years, water is going to become very important uh, as a nutrient to protect. So Jim, do you think it's going to be the efficiency of water use to make the most of the obviously shrinking water supplies in the West? Or, or, and obviously that's going to be the big issue in the West, but if you're living in Des Moines, it's probably Ann and herbicides yep. in the water, right? Right, nitrates and pesticides. So, so you know, you are the, you know, you're one of the people in this room that has the depth of experience to, to think about the places in the organic uh, uh, rule where you maybe could tweak it to more consistently claim the benefit from organic production. Now, you know, Jim, there's absolutely no reason why an organic corn farmer in, in Iowa can't put on 150 tons of manure. Now maybe their certifier would call it. Actually, is them. in the rule already. Uh, well, I'd, I'd actually like to talk to you about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, you know, I I I think you're right. Uh, a lot of you know, a lot of I I don't think much about water, and I should. It's a huge issue in our region. I live on this beautiful river. I care so much about the health of the steelhead that I come up and get to get to abuse with a fly. Don't kill very many of them. But I'd like, I think the, I, I would like to be able to get more involved in water quality related research. And I'm actually going to do a conference in December on, in the Chesapeake Bay Area. Those folks out there wanted me to get involved. So any of you folks that are working on water, uh, you know, be in touch. I agree with them on water. I live in the Kickapoo watershed and there's some pretty substantial slopes there and the organic farms would obviously have higher organic matter and slow the water down and it would infiltrate and it would it would reconstitute those trout streams as it uh, goes into the aquifers. Another thing is uh, organic farming is carbon farming. It sequesters carbon. So maybe there's a way to reward people for sequestering carbon because we all know what global climate change is. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, uh, I, I'm really enjoying, I've gotten quite involved with the Soil Renaissance Project. It's a, I think a pretty serious effort that, that might uh, pull a rabbit or two out of the hat. And uh, of course, their, their mission in life is how to develop public policies that are going to promote carbon farming. And, and you know, if, if we had a way, a practical way, to go out and measure soil health or soil quality on a farm or organic matter content for that matter, like you can measure pH in your swimming pool, uh, it would make a huge difference. But the problem with the problem with soil health is there's no simple, reliable, replicable system to measure it. Uh, and if you can't measure it, then it's hard to say whether it's hard to say where you're at. Is it good, better, best, uh, declining in, into the danger zone? Is it getting better or worse? And without roughly acceptable and credible answers to those questions, it's really hard to build a policy framework, whether it's in the public arena or in the private arena, that incentivizes steps to build soil quality. Uh, there's a lot of smart people working on it, and I think there will be some progress, but uh, my gut sense is we're, we've got to recognize that there are, I mean, how, how do you measure love? You know, it's just, I think we're all smart enough to know. We're not going to develop the U.S. index of love. It's too damn complicated. And I think soil health may be similar. So we've got to 
change our focus on how we're going to promote soil health to things that we know work, like cover crops. You know, I mean, how could you go wrong in promoting cover crops, especially if you do it in, in a regionally and farming system appropriate way? So I, I hope that's where that's going to shift, but it's, you know, it, it's in play and complicated. Mr. Pavich, yeah. good to see you, man. I know. Well, I, I, good to see you, too, and I really want to thank you for taking all the bullets because if anybody has taken the bullets in the nutritional debate, you really have, and I really want to thank you for that because that's not an easy subject. I'm still and, standing. Yeah, I know, and you're still standing, and I really think that part of that is exactly what you said. We need more money to verify the actual bigger science that the organic community has. And I say bigger science from the standpoint is that the other side doesn't have science, they just have clout. And, um, but I wanted to clarify one point on the uh, NutriClean thing. And the reason that it was 0.01 was not because Dr. Rhodes was trying to make that claim. We went to FDA and their testing methodology, which of course was old testing methodology, <laughs> did not include tetra mass spectrometers. Uh, to get down to parts per trillion, uh, which is really what they want, we wanted to do. They said, no, you're going to have to claim, this is all we're going to let you go ahead and claim, which of course was not good enough, and then eventually became that. But I, but I really think that the evolution where we're going and where, we've become, where, where we're coming to now is a much better place, and we just have to keep, you know, banging away. And I really, again, I think that this is this is one of those things where um, we got to move a lot faster. And I'm, I don't know where to get the money, but we got to move a lot faster. Um, How do we I, do that? I don't know, Steve. Uh, I don't. I don't think the money is going to come from government. Uh, I, I don't see. A, I don't see too much chance that this this is going to this situation that I described is going to change. I think the the best w way is to just start doing the patient work of getting some of these health claims approved through the government and you know if there's a half dozen health claims approved by FDA backed up by science that are grounded in an organic system it's going to be kind of hard for the government to you know stand up with a straight face and say there's nothing, no benefits from organic. Um, so, you know, I I think that I, I could imagine the first health claim being approved in three years if our friends at Organic Valley decided to really go for it, like starting now. But maybe five years is more realistic because, you know, they're, you're probably talking about a minimum investment of $5 million to, to put the, the science together to support it. Um, and, you know, uh, some companies may feel they don't want to try to go that on their own. Uh, that's why I, I really tried to emphasize the need for some industry consortia. Um, you know, I, I, think, um, I think you get two or three of the big players together in, in, a, you know, in any of the areas, and um, I, I think there would be enough capital there uh, to, to, make, to make a go of it. One last question. It's more kind of a comment, actually two comments. Number one, I very much appreciate that uh, your message about keeping it positive rather than dissing the competition. I think uh, that is supporting the organic system rather than looking, you know, like they have to prove something against someone else and, and you know, I think that is supporting the organic agriculture to keep it positive without st or and stopping to try to compare themselves. That's my first comment. Uh, the second comment is um, you were presenting the data on uh, the milk and the milk composition with the omega um, uh, or with the fatty acid profiles and um, I am totally believing the um, composition uh, and the data that you have shown. The thing where I am a little bit hesitant to believe you or, or where I'm not quite following your jump is uh, I'm missing even in or I mean, based on what you have presented, I am missing the data that is supporting truly the health claim because in order to have a health claim, like you were just sure. kind of saying, I need to have the data to have, okay, the dose dependency um, and truly the health data on the health benefit 
Um, so I would be, I just want to caution you to not maybe go overboard with the given data, at least the way it was presented right now. Okay, good, good, good comments. Um, on the omegas, there is a health claim already approved for omega-3 fatty acids by FDA. Uh, and once a company pe petitions the FDA to approve a health claim that's linked to a nutrient, that's truly a generic health claim. The next company can come in and use exactly the same health claim. They don't have to pay the company for it. But what they have to do is put together the data that shows that their product has either at least 25% more of a good thing or 25% more of a bad thing to be able to put the claim on their product. So if Organic Valley goes first and puts together the data, unless Horizon is basically starting at the same time, they'll probably have the market at least for two years, maybe three years, without anybody else getting in. But I think we, you know, if any of these health claims in organic make it, and if they actually elicit a response in consumers, you know the rest of the industry is going to try to follow the road, down that road. Now, on the positive message, this is really an important point. In the early days, Roger, Roger Blomom and I remember back in the days in Dorfa, before the OFTA, when organic was, it was very small, very small sector, very poorly organized. And at that time, one of the ways to get people to pay attention and through the early years was to draw some of the contrast between what the successful organic farmers of the day were doing and what convention was doing. Who, who, who was uh, Willie Lockeritz? Remember Willie's study, that first comparison study that came out in what? Roger, was it 1970 or something? What was it? 76. Okay, so, you know, that got a lot of attention. And I think it was logical and, and reasonable that people in the organic community drew those extinction, distinctions to try to get a little bit of attention. But fast forward 30 years later, you know, organic is a big part of the, the system. And now, because organic is a real threat to the conventional food industry, the conventional food industry is going, whoa, we need to tell people that this organic halo, it's, you know, it's at best copper, it sure as hell ain't gold. And so the, or, the conventional industry is really coming back hard now. And a lot of them justify it by some of the language and some of the things that, that all of us said in the early days comparing organic to conventional. So in the early part of the cycle, I'd say organic advocates were part of that messaging and part of that problem, but then it grew and now the conventional industry is responding like an, a, an immune system under serious attack. And, and you know, most people in the U.S. don't realize that the, the debate about the future of agriculture in Europe, it's organic versus GMOs. That's it. And that hasn't happened in the U.S. quite to the same degree. Maybe it will, but I think the problem now is people in the organic world are bristling from the kind of attacks that are coming from the conventional side. And, you know, we kind of have to get the, you know, turn the other cheek attitude. But there are some people that that's going to that's gonna come, that's gonna come hard to. So, I completely agree. You saw I tried to emphasize the positive points, but boy, I'll tell you, there's a lot of people been kicked in the ass around about this stuff for a long time, and I would certainly include myself. And and sometimes it's it's really hard to avoid going there, but as a community, we need to work on that skill. It's called what incremental improvement, right, Brian? So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today, and um, we hope you can come back tomorrow and um, join us for the subsequent workshops from the Organic Agriculture Research Symposium. Thanks very much.